Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for a very special edition of Wowza Live with our host, Ned Dennison. Hello, everyone. I'm the chairperson of the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame. We have one of our honor coaches with us today, the famous Canadian coach, Gilles Poffin. Gilles, say hello. Hi. Hi, everybody. Nice to be there and uh, enjoying that interview coming up. So, Gilles, talk to us about your early days in sports. Uh, we have we have honorees who were professional footballers, soccer players, baseball players, um, but uh, you you, uh, you you combined sort of uh, a, a decathlon with uh, with swimming with some some high performance cycling. So, t tell us about your varied sporting background you, for you personally. Okay, uh, well, you know, I would say that my highest achievements were in track and field. I have a Canadian championship in track and field. I have Eastern Canadian championships in track and field, provincial championships and records, and uh, school, college, and so on. So that was a sport that I was coached, that was well organized, that was, I was part of a good team uh, in Montreal. And uh, we also won the Canadian Championship as a team in Regina, Saskatchewan. That was one year, that was in 62, uh, 61, one year before I joined the Royal Canadian Mountain Police. The training center was also in Regina. So I knew already there that I would be there. So uh, I, was a, I did the decathlon once in a while because there was not a decathlon in every meet. And, uh, but my strongest event were shot put, and discus and uh, 100 meter and high jump. Uh, other events like pole vault and all that, I had very, very poor technique and I lost a lot of points. And what I used to do in those days, like in 1960, Rayford Johnson from the United States won the Rome Olympics in the decathlon. And I actually wrote to him and uh, he talked to me about maybe uh, looking for a scholarship at UCLA, but I kind of shied out because I couldn't speak English. and. Uh, I said, how the heck am I going to do my studies if I can't speak the language and so on? And I regret that to that day, not having tried to do that. But uh, just the same, you know, uh, I, I used to take his point total, my point total, and make an average. And I came up that I was capable of doing 81% of the Olympic champion. So I said, in school, you know, that's a pretty good mark. So I did that throughout my career, just taking the best in the world, what are they doing? I did that in powerlifting. I did that in, in, in track and field. I did that in cycling road races. I was always giving myself a percentage compared to the, to the best ones. And when I got into swimming, uh, which was not, I, I, you know, I wasn't very fast. And Herman Willemsey, when he wrote his book, Herman, you know, uh, dedicated the book and he says, maybe not the faster swimmer, but a terrific trainer when I swam in Canada. And, and to me, that was good. And I told Herman, I said, I'd like to cross that lake. And I said, I don't have a coach. I, I don't think that nobody's working on my technique or anything. So he sent me a book, Forbes Carlisle on swimming. And uh, so he dedicated, he said, use it, my friend, use it cleverly, and probably you'll make it across Lake St. John next year. So I started looking at that and workouts and so on in there. And, and all of a sudden, you know, uh, I'm entering Lake St. John and uh, I didn't make it. I missed it by 300 meters, but that was a 32K. And that all started when I was 12 years old because my Boy Scout leader, Mr. Martin Bedard, uh, said, we have to organize a, a swim across that lake. And that was in 1955, it was centennial year of Roberval, which was my hometown. And uh, during that year, uh, the school I was attending from grade one to grade 12, I had the highest academic average. And I was honored for that, got all kinds of prizes and everything else. And um, I was pretty proud of that. And I said, boy, it'd be nice if I could, you know, uh, when I was 12 years old thinking, I could cross that lake one day. So the motto of the town of Roberval is with a valiant heart, nothing is impossible. In French, it's a coeur vaillant, rien d'impossible. And um, so when Jean Camiot finally succeeded, everybody else didn't finish. Uh, 
I had to take a typewriter to a newspaper guy, you know, those old Underwood typewriter in those days, that's 65 years ago. And he starts writing, John Camillot just accomplished the impossible. So I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, I don't want to be cocky or anything like that, but I said, it wasn't impossible. If it would have been impossible, he wouldn't have done it. And he said, this is our centennial year and the motto of this town is with a valiant heart, nothing is impossible. So he says, you're pretty cocky for your age, you know? <laughs> I said, I don't want to be cocky, but I said, it's not impossible. So that, that was the start and that stuck with me for the rest of my life. I, I was involved in, in that sport, which I wasn't really, really good as a swimmer. The best race I had though, and I'll have those clippings for you. I finally found them. My son had more than I thought. He's putting some type of a scrapbook back together. This just warmed my heart right up. But it was the 1968 Saginaw swim. Uh, this one was, you know, was very good. Abu Heath won it. Abu Heath from Egypt won the race in 9-10. Then Judith Dennis from Holland was second in 9-10-23. Then Regina Corsier, George Park, Horatio Iglesias, Dennis Matush, Steve Ramsden. I finished 11th in 9 hours, 43 minutes, and 40 seconds. And I made that average 95%. <laughs> the best in the world were there. And, and I hate to say that as a coach, you know. I, I hate to say what I'm going to say. It's the only time I really worked my butt off. You know, the other times I didn't know enough what I was capable of doing. And I was holding back and holding back. I wanted to have enough to finish the swims I was entering. And that one, I said, well, the heck with it. That is what happened. I'm, I'm going for it. Because there were six of us from the region here, from the area, and we had within this Canadian championship, we had our own regional championship with a trophy and, and, and a small prize money of $125 in those days. And uh, so I wanted to, to win that, and uh, I did. So I finished 11th and out of 24 and win that. And when I look at all the averages and all the sports, I mean, it, it's around 80%, you know, 78, 80, 82. But this one, 95%, well, I said, and I figured that out last night <laughs> when I found the clipping and looked at the time. Gilles, a couple of things for our viewers. First of all, yeah. um, Gilles mentioned clippings. Uh, Gilles had a... Um, had a marathon swimming period. And uh, unfortunately, um, today, none of that is recorded in, um, in, in either uh, Open Waterpedia or the Long Swims database. And as soon as he sends us those clippings, then the, those, those results are going to be part of our digital record. The second thing I want to point out to people is that in that swim, he, he rattled off quickly the names of five or six swimming honorees. So for an honor coach in the water with those characters at the same time was, uh, you know, a real, a real accomplishment and 95% is, is fantastic. I think that that's what I'm the most proud of as a, as a marathon swimmer. And uh, I suppose, Ned, that you don't have the names of these people either because you would have mine if you would have those results on hand in the Saguenay swim. So the swims that Horacio swam and Abu Heath and... Uh, Cherbini, who got killed in a car accident not too long after. And um, there's a bunch of people in there that I'm sure that these particular swims, 67 and 68 in the Saguenay swim, are not recorded. And the best in the world were there. Uh, Herman uh, won it also the year before. And um, Tom Busey uh, didn't finish in 68, but won it. Uh, in, they had a master class, the only three swimmers. What was the master class? Was uh, Horatio Iglesias, and it was um, Herman Willemsey. Everybody that had won the best in the world at one time. So it's not the same master that, that we're referring to now, like master swimming. It was like the real masters of the, of, of the trade life. And, uh, but what I did, I rearranged the times because we were all in the water at the same time. And uh, that's how I finished 11. Otherwise, I would be uh, less three because they were in another category. I would have been nine. Uh, but, you, you, yeah. you, you coached, um, you coached for, forever. 
But I just wanted to use Lex and Jean as, as an example. Um, you coached, and these are all honorees, Carlos Ladia, Herman yeah. Vilmsi, Horacio Inglesia, John Kinsella, uh, Paul Asmuth, Christine Cosette, Vicky Keith. Okay, yeah. now here's the pressure. Who is the best one? Well, to me, it's, it's, it's very clear that um, I have, you know, well, John stayed at my place. He's an Olympic gold medalist, the only male Olympic gold medalist to swim in Lake St. John in 65 years of history. Uh, that wasn't a relay. Uh, he was a silver medalist at 15 years of age, which is still a record, the youngest male ever to, to medal in the uh, in the Olympics, that was in uh, uh, Mexico in 68, and then uh, the, the, the gold in 72, and the world record being the first to go under 15 minutes. In Lake St. John, his record stood for 23 years before they beat it. And uh, they wouldn't have beat it by that much because the final um, 700 meters roughly uh, is a sprint with a special prize money. And he had so much, he was so much ahead. He said, you know, we didn't have GPS. We, we, we had a, you know, a, a stopwatch. That's all we had. And then we had a, a, a boussole in French. The word skips to me there um, to orient it yourself there. You know, it was a compass. Eh? A compass? Yeah, compass. <laughs> so, so we had a compass and there was fog and I said, the, the compass is good, geez, when the fog goes, are we going to be going to Robertville or somewhere else around that lake? And then we had rowers, there was no, you know, in the early years. And anyway, so um, then uh, John won six, won six years, won six years in a row, beat his own record five times. And I'd have to say that, you know, that, that's pretty darn good. After six years, well, he says, now I have to go to work. I have an MBA from Harvard. And I say, he says, I'm going to be working for Bank of America. I have a job with them. So I'm going to work. So, uh, but at the same time, you know, the other ones like Herman, if I go by era, you know, it's hard to see who was the best because it's such over a long period of time, and they didn't uh, actually swim at the same time. They didn't really compete against one another. And but one thing that happened with, with Paul Asma, and you know, came 46 seconds one year from breaking John's record. And I hadn't worked with Paul uh, up to that time. And during the trophy awards that night, the questions was put to him. They said how could you come so close to beating that record that's been standing for so long and not making it? And he says, that's because Joe Padman was not in my boat. And <laughs> I'm getting, I'm getting goose. I'm not kidding you, man. I'm, uh, this is still getting me emotional. Paul Asmuth that I hadn't worked with, hardly talked to up to that point, saying that on that stage in front of all the crowd there, so after I went over to thank him and he says, from now on, can I work with you? Can we work together, prepare for the swim? And the first double crossing that they had, he swam for two hours and 13 minutes and was pulled out and they didn't want to take him back. And I, show, I had showed him pictures, you know, of uh, how we broke the ice early in the spring, we got in the ice, we took cold showers. And I said, you got to do stupid things like that because I said, you know, Paul, unless you're completely screwed up. I said, the body likes to enjoy itself and not suffer a lot of pain. And I said, when you take control of that and you have pain, like from cold water, for instance, and you persist in exposing yourself to it, then what does it do? It adapts to it. It says, I hate it to hurt. I'm asking to stop that stupidity, but he, you know, his mind says, no, I'm gonna keep doing it. So you're going to make changes and it worked in this case, it worked in my case, it worked with John Kinsella. John had a little bit of problems getting growing pain a lot in cold water, couldn't kick anymore and uh, stuff like that. So these are things with it. So Paul, when I was with him, was the very best. And uh, 
you know, with the Canadian team, then uh, Ron Jacks was a head coach for the world in, in Perth. I was his assistant. And uh, Greg Streppel did very, very well in his career. And I learned a lot from uh, Ron Jacks. And Ron also said, you know, he says, everything that I know about open water swimming, you, you started me on it. You gave me a heck of a good go, a good start. And he says, so when he had a chance to choose, uh, you know, um, another coach to go with him to the world in Perth, he chose me. In Argentina, he chose me. In the world in Rome, he chose me again to go with him. And uh, so we had a lot of discussions preparing the race strategy and feedings and stuff like that together. And then he had Richard Weinberger winning a world championship, winning a bronze medal in the Olympics in the open water. Round swam with Indiana at four, uh, swam in four Olympics and all that. He's a very, very good friend up to that day. So these are the things, you know, that got involved. And then, you know, if, I, if I'm going to go all over the place like that, I'm going to keep going a little bit. So, so, so talk to us, Sheila, about um, the difference between feeding Greg in um, Rome when he was the world champion at 25K and yeah. feeding Steve Wozniak when you were a young boy. Give us a comparison. <laughs> yeah, well, well, in the world, I wasn't with... Uh, Ron Jacks was in, in Greg's boat. I was with Kim Dyke, okay? Uh, that, that was the other Canadian. So I was in Kim Dyke's boat, and she, she did very well there, too. And uh, uh, Ron was their regular coach in the pool and all that, and we worked together in open water. But uh, I know what, what Ron was feeding his swimmers and, and all that, and we had made plans. So it would be like we had hot chocolate with honey in it, uh, then we also had uh, like Gatorade, half and half uh, Gatorade and water with a gel in it. Um, then we had to mix that in advance because it doesn't mix very well. And just stuff like that, you know, nothing very complicated. And uh, the only thing that uh, we had to change a lot, like I remember with Herman Willemsey, uh, Herman wanted to go for uh, three hours without taking anything at all, and then started to feed once an hour. And we know today that's really, really not enough. You gotta start a lot earlier than that. So these are the things that we learn along the way that we perfected. And I had a chance to organize coaching clinics for young coaches interested in, they were good coaches in the pool, but didn't have a clue about um, uh, open water swimming. And another thing that really, really changed in the eye of a lot of top uh, pool coaches happened in Perth. What happened in Perth is that we had the World Aquatic Championship and the whole Canadian team, water polo, diving, uh, uh, pool swimming, and uh, open water swimming, we, uh, we were all at the same small hotel. Um, and... Um, we were, you know, the long distance swimmer, the open water swimmer, like Greg Streppel and, and Kim and all that. And we, we were sitting at a table and kind of being looked down on us by the other coaches, you know, that, that, that the saying that if you're not that good in the pool, then you go into open water swimming, you know. And then the day of the race, the 25K, it was a day off in the pool. So the Canadian manager, Canadian team manager, decided to rent a big boat that he got the whole team on. And he says, let's go see that race. And when we finished that, that night, you know, then everybody kind of crowded on our table, sat with us, started to ask questions, which didn't happen before. And one of the coach there uh, told me, he says, Jill, swimming fast, I can't understand that. But swimming that fast, that long, man, he says, I'm flabbergasted. He says, I don't understand it. He says, that was moon. That was really, really a race. And uh, so that changed the whole thing. Then Swim Canada started to look at it more seriously. Then I had a chance to, to, to be on that committee though I presided. I was the chairman of the Open Water Committee from 1991 to 95, right after the World Championship. So they said, we have to do something about open water. 
we have to get that sport going more seriously. So it, it's then, you know, at one point during the 1976 Olympics, uh, Lake St. John was the only one left and uh, here in Quebec and even in Canada. As before, we had the 24 hours of La Chuc, we had the Saguenay swim, we had the Spiviac, we had Mega, we, we had a whole bunch of, of swims that, you know, that swimmers could, could get prize money and most, a lot of them were students and all that. So Lake St. John says, we're not going to get many entries for one race here. So I was chief of police in Chibougamau at that time in a, in a small remote town up northern Quebec. And I said, I'm going to organize a swim here. And I put a committee together and we organized a race and everybody came. Uh, we had 11 countries, the radar station, the Canadian Air Force uh, radar station in Chibougamau uh, put the lodging for everybody. Cafeterias, if you have swimmers from Egypt and all that, are they Muslim? I said, yeah, some of them are Muslim. She said, well, our dietitian is going to prepare their food for them, whatever they want, and they can order. And man, this went really, really well. We had a whole week of activities, uh, social activities, uh, cultural activities, sports activities. Uh, every sports got involved in doing some type of competition. And uh, then, but we said, we can't hold raising that much money every year for the prize money. So we cycled uh, eight of us and Bill Heiss, uh, you know Bill? Bill Heiss, yeah, came with, with us from, from LG2, that big hydro project in Quebec, to Shibugamo. So we went 1,300 kilometers in six days. And we were being sponsored so much money per kilometers from a whole bunch of people. So we picked up something like $37,000 with the eight of us doing that ride. And um, so that- This is on bicycle. Yeah, a bicycle to raise money. Then we got uh, the, uh, uh, some good sponsorship and all that. And it lasted only three years and we knew it was gonna be temporary. Then other swims kicked in in bigger towns and all that. And um, then I was decorated for some reason by La Traversée for having saved La Traversée by putting up that swim. You know? So they gave me some type of a medal. They came to Shibogamo to do that and they made it official and uh, so- but Jill, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let you off the hook. When no. you were a young coach, I think you were 16, it yeah. was your job to help honoree Steve Wozniak win a big race. And, and I, I understand you didn't do such a good job at that. Tell us about that day. <laughs> yeah, well, Steve arrived a little late. They were, they were calling his name and he wasn't there. All of a sudden we see that guy with a pack sack and now he comes down the stairs on the wharf and says, all right, I'm Steve Wenziak. And he says, I have problems with my car and drove for Buffalo and all that. And he says, would there be anyone here that, that do you have anyone that, that's going to be in my boat for me? Well, I said, it's up to you too. And I understood enough English at that time to, to realize what was going on. So I was 16 years old. So I, I went up, introduced myself to him. I said, I'll, I'll go in your boat. I'll, I'll do it for you. And he says, all right. And I said, um, he says, I'm going to explain the feeding I'm going to, I'm going to use. So he had a thermos full of black coffee and another one with cognac in it. And he said, you know, he says, this water is very cold. And he says, I, I'm, he said, I might, eat some, I might eat something else later. But he said, for a while, if, I, if I'm cold, I'm going to make a sound with my mouth, which is going to be like this. And he said, if you hear that, if, uh, you know, we could hear it. No problem. If you hear that, you mix two ounces of, uh, of cognac with four ounces of black coffee. And you give me that in, in those paper cups. So I said, all right, that's not too complicated. So we got in the boat, we then the start bring the gunshot to start off the swimmers and away we went. And we were about a hundred meters in and I hear, ah! son of a gun, you know, did I hear that? The, my rowers in the boat said, yeah, yeah, he, he did that. <laughs> so I mixed the thing and I gave it to him. And we, we got about close to six kilometers in the Peribanka River before we actually hit Lake St. John. At the beginning, they started at, at the, uh, right at, uh, in the lake itself was 26K. 
before it became 32. And um, so anyway, by the time it got at the end of the river, starting in the lake and all that, you know, I had given him maybe four times two ounces of cognac, which <laughs> <laughs> it was quite often. And I said, I'll never have enough to make it across the lake anyway. So I was kind of panicking there. And all of a sudden he stops and he's sick to his stomach. And he says, you know what? <laughs> he said, he said, I'm still very cold. I'm getting drunk. I'm sick and I'm getting out right here. <laughs> so my first experience as a young trainer in a boat. <laughs> so so you, you had many swimmers in Lake St. Jean over the over the years and, and Lake St. Jean Every swimmer described it as this massive party. Uh, yeah. That it was a swim. Yeah. Which of the swimmers enjoyed the party the most? I'd say during the double crossing uh, would be that guy from New Zealand, um, Phil oh, Rush. Right, Philip Rush. Yeah, he was he was a, a, a party guy, but he was as tough as nails. You know, he could he, he could be partying the night before we. Uh, or during the week, but well, he was doing great, big, great workouts, just the same. He was a party guy, uh, Philip, and uh, I met him again at the Pan Pack several years later. He was the head coach in the pool for, for his swimmers and um, from New Zealand in, at the Pan Pacific Games. And uh, I went over and talked to him and I said, then, oh, he says, well, I guess we changed a lot. I said, yeah, we have changed a lot. and. Uh, yeah, I'd say that was the guy. Uh, Carlos Larriero was pretty good party goer also. Um, other ones that there were very, the opposite would be Paul Asmuth, John, John Kinsella, uh, would be uh, take things very seriously. Another anecdote with John was this one. So I said, we're going to communicate with a blackboard, you know, with a board, when I'm going to need some chalk. And I'm going to tell him, um, who's ahead of you, who's behind you, how far approximately in, in meters uh, uh, they are from you or in yards, whatever you like. I can. We had to approximate the best we could. And then, uh, uh, then we learned that if we drop a cup in the water and, and then start the stopwatch and the next swimmer would reach that cup and stop it, then we put, yeah, we have, you have about a two and a half minute lead. And so we developed some strategy like that, but here it is. So John says, where are you going? I said, I'm going to go buy some chalk. I said, uh, because, you know, that was the day before. And I said, I was checking everything that we needed and all that getting prepared. And um, he said, I'm going to go buy some chalk. He says, listen, don't buy any chalk to tell me who's going to be in front of me because there won't be anybody in front of me. <laughs> so just buy enough chalk to see who's behind me. And somewhere in the middle of the lake, he said, who's second? He let, got his head up, said, you know who's second? And my radio was, I had problems to hear it. It was making a lot of noise. And I had to, to rely on the radio station giving positions because I, I couldn't tell. We were, we were that far ahead. So I was up standing in the boat with my binoculars, you know, and looking around. And he got his head up. He said, holy man, he says, when I asked you a second and you know you need binoculars to find him, he said that you feel good. <laughs> yeah. So these are the things that I cherish most as uh, souvenirs and all that. And Paul, you know, I really, really had to plead with La Traversée. I negotiated that for him. I said, he's the best in the world right now in all the other swim. Yeah, but he didn't prove he could do a double crossing and everything. And I said, I said, I think you have a lot of respect for me. I think, you know, you, you, you think, well, I feel that I have a lot of credibility. I've been working with him. And I said, he's going, he's going to do it. He's going to make it. He's much tougher in cold water than he was. And um, you've seen it in other races that he had pulled out before that were even colder than that he not only finished, but won. So put that together and I made a pretty good case and finally they accepted him and we won and, and broke the double crossing record uh, easily. Yeah. So that Michel, was you, a great you, moment. You, you recently had a, had a health scare. 
Uh, yeah. Tell, tell, tell us about it and, and, and how you're doing now. Yeah, okay. So that's, uh, that's well, six weeks ago and now. That's quite recent. And uh, I was on a bike ride because I'm a member of the uh, Robertville Cycling Club. And they have three groups. They have a very strong group. They have a middle group. And they have some uh, group that just goes for the ride and look at the uh, scenery and all that. So I'm in the strongest group, you know, which I shouldn't have been in the last couple of years, but things were going good. And this group, they're pretty nuts, you know, they, they, they go pretty hard. And when it's flat or going downhill, no problems, but some pretty long uphill, I was starting to feel it real bad. So what happened in the, where it was a 50K for first time out this season, and uh, we can't uh, draft because we have to keep a couple of bike uh, lengths between each other and uh, because we're breeding hard and so on. So that was the, the rule. So we're not drafting behind anybody, which helped before, but didn't help on that day. And then we're going uphill and I'm at the last of 12, 13, 14 people, between 12 and 14 people. And we're all, you know, and all of a sudden I'm starting to, to lose ground a little bit. And the team captain in front kind of looked back and says, all right, we're less one cyclist. That was me. And uh, so they ease off a little bit so that I get on top of the hill closer and then catch up with them again. And then the next hill in my mind, that competitive, bloody, stupid spirit that I should let go now, <laughs> kicked in and I said, I'm not going to be the one who's going to be less one cyclist in that hill. So I really, really pushed it and I pushed it too hard and I felt a little bit of a chest pain. Not, not that much, but something I said, oh boy, that, that's a signal right here. And um, then we finished and finished, everything went well. And uh, we're talking to one another. So I don't live in Rubberval, I live in, here in Chukudimi, which is a hundred and 20 kilometers uh, away. So I'm putting my bike back in the car because it's starting to rain. So I'm not going to put it on the rack. I'm going to put it inside the, my SUV. And um, then I sit in the car and the pain is getting really stronger. So I chew two aspirin. And if anybody listening that feel that they have a chest pain that could be a heart attack, please use this recommendation. This is not Gilles Padvin's recommendation. It's the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation and Guidelines with the American Heart Association. And it's all over the place. And even aspirin puts right there uh, on, the, on their vials. And, uh, uh, and it's, there's a red cross on it. And it says, if you feel pain, call 911 and chew two babies aspirin. The paramedics that I teach, I teach them. Uh, the, uh, these techniques and, um, you know, the, we have the uh, maintenance of uh, protocols and all that, that we have a contract with the, uh, with the uh, uh, Department of Health. And uh, this is the protocol they use for, in case the person would be allergic, so they can ask better questions and Mr. and Mrs. everybody. And uh, so it's two for the general public and four for paramedics when they reach a person that has chest pain. If you're not allergic to aspirin and if you didn't have any bleeding, stomach bleeding in your stools or haven't been operated in the last couple of weeks, know that because it's even if you take warfarin, even if you take a, a, a very strong blood uh, clear, uh, thinning uh, medication or anything, aspirin, is a level one, uh, it, it's a level one recommendation in the core. And on top of being level one, it's a category A, which means it's a scientifically proven that it's plus, 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 plus good with very little side effects for whoever is going to be using that. So I did that right away. And then I got to the last street lights, maybe a minute later, and the hospital is right there, 300, 400 meters away. And that pain is still there. And I said, I'm not taking any chance. So I just did, just turned left at the light, got in the emergency department. I walked in there and uh, there's nobody at the reception, no nurse at the triage or anything. Uh, so I said, uh, where's everybody? I just said, you, you just 
wash your hands and take a number. I said, no, 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 I'm not taking a number right now. I, said, <laughs> I knew exactly that we had to react really fast. So I kind of, you know, knocked on the door and this nurse appeared and she said, did you wash your hands? I said, yeah. She said, well, just take a number and sit down. I'll be with, and I said, I can't wait. I just finished a bike ride. I have real bad chest pain right now. So, oh, she said, sorry. She said, you go in right away. So I got in and then they did the electrocardiogram right away. And they said, well, you're having a heart attack. And I had the pain. So they asked me the question. They injected me the thrombolytic uh, medication to dissolve whichever clot would be blocking an artery and all that. And very quickly, my ECG became normal. And then they transferred me by ambulance to Shkudimi uh, to in cardiology because that's a big center. There's over 4,000 employees in there and it's uh, one of the largest in this province and they have a good cardiology and it's its own. So um, the cardiologist that saw me at the um, stabilization room uh, units uh, did an, another electrocardiogram and said, that looked pretty good, but we're going to do some nuclear testing of your heart arteries and all that. And the, another cardiologist was running that test. And uh, so they inject you with uh, some iodine and stuff like that. And they take those pictures of your heart and all. And then I had the tutor going right in. And he says, I don't see any blockage anywhere. And he says, I can't see any damage either. I don't see any bad lesion or anything. I, I don't see it. And he said, your enzymes in the blood test are very low. It should be ceiling high after a heart attack. What did you do? So I told him about the aspirins that I was very close to the hospital. I went right away. They thrombolytic me. And he says, whatever was there, it's gone. And he says, I thought maybe we would have to do some bypasses or anything like that, but all you're going to be doing for the next year is taking Brilinta, which is a medication, to make sure that I don't have any clotting going on. And he says, the last thing you want to do is stop training. But then, as another cardiologist did an echography the next day, and she said, I know that you're recording what you eat, you're recording your training session, your blood pressures and all that, and you're very disciplined. And you're also recording your best times on such and such. She said, do all the rest, but the best time at your age, that competition. And if you go back to that cycling club change group, <laughs> go down in the middle somewhere. And uh, she said, do the rest. And I said, for my 80th birthday, which is in two years, I, I wanted to, to go around Lake St. John, which I did solo uh, last year, 242 kilometers in the same day. And um, I had a strong wind against me for a good part of the year, then uh, side wind, then no wind at all to finish. I was hoping I'd have it in my back. Well, she said, you can still do that, but you're gonna have to do it easy. You're gonna have to take breaks once in a while, start early in the morning, so I have a group of friends. So Bill Heiss confirmed that he will be coming with uh, to be in my group to go around because he's cycling a lot. I have to get in touch with John, John Kinsella, because John did a bike ride with us to raise funds oh. for an organization. He came from Chicago with his bike. And uh, that was a, a 165 kilometer uh, deal that, uh, uh, sorry, 265 kilometer deal. That Jill? Jill? Yeah. You haven't told us how you did on the last hill. Yeah. Uh, I stayed there with the group. Good man. Good man. <laughs> <laughs> it gave me a heart attack, but I wasn't the one less cyclist. <laughs> if I had to choose again being, you know, less one cyclist, I'd say, you guys go ahead. I'll finish on my own. I, I won't, I won't get myself a heart attack. To, to Jill, right. We, we, we're, we're coming to the end of it. I just have one question for you. I, we hope to uh, interview uh, Régent Le Corsier in a couple of yeah. weeks. Was he the best swimmer in Quebec ever? And, and tell us something about him that will make us smile. Yeah. Yeah. Régent was yeah, definitely the best swimmer in Quebec uh, uh, at that time. 
And then we had some of the good ones, which I coached, uh, really, really coached him. He came to my house. Like John, John would spend the summer with us, with Bill Heiss. Horacio Iglesias would tend to spend the summer in our house. Uh, Claudio Plitt uh, just had recently married and, and stayed with us a couple of weeks, not as long as the other ones. Uh, but we always took some swimmers in so that could exchange with them what they were doing in the pool and all that and stuff like that. And Réjean at that period was the best to a point where in one race, I don't know if you'll remember that, and he came over to my room the night before. He says, Gilles, why, why do you keep doing those races with us? And all that. He said, you're not that fast. You're not earning any money. And uh, why? You, you're good in other sports. Uh, why, why are you doing this one? So I looked at him. I said, Rija, as a swimmer, I'm sure as heck not as good as you. As a boxer, get out of my room. <laughs> <laughs> then I started to laugh. <laughs> he looked at me, I broke out laughing. I said, it's a joke. <laughs> yeah, no, he, he was good. And um, yeah, he was, when he won in 1960, he, he won La Traversée, and it took 22 years before another guy from this province would win it, which was Robert Lachance. And the newspaper guy from Montreal is very, very famous, Réjean Tremblay with La Presse, which is the biggest newspaper in, in, in this province, uh, wrote, who between Hazmat and Plitt will win the Traversée tomorrow? So I know him very well. So I said, that's, that's good. That's a good choice. But I said, you're missing one. You should have written who between Hazmat, Plitt, and La Chance would win the Traversée tomorrow. He said, Jill, if he didn't know you're swimming as well as you do, I'd say you're not. Who's that guy? I said, you'll find out tomorrow. And Robert won. And after, he kept saying, come and see me. <laughs> I was far away. And the next headline says, the victory of La Chance, Pat Van never doubted it. <laughs> but I did doubt it a little bit. I said, it should be between Paul Asmuth, Claudio Blit, or Robert Lachance that I said to him. I didn't say Robert Lachance at all. I said, he would be a good choice in there. One of them would probably win. You're just missing one name in there. So when we won in the paper, he said, I never doubted it. So. Gilles, we'll, we, we'll have to say good, goodbye. Yeah. I, I, want, I want to say 65 years of service to the sport. You are part of our history and absolutely delighted to talk to you today. Thank you well, very much. Well, thank you. I, I was really looking forward to this and I want to say hi to all the people that will see that and mainly all the friends I developed in that sport over the years and the ones I was I had the honor to help uh, during those swims and all that and uh, preparing for them uh, at a later date and all that. So thank you. Thank you all. And um, we're getting, I'm getting to an age where memories are very important.